You are listening to the Hello Sport Podcast. What is up, punters and dribblers? Welcome back to another episode of All Talk with Tom and Eddie, the Hello Sport Podcast. Back for another week of Dribble and Yarn with some of the best and brightest people, minds, characters. Characters. Thank you, Edward. Individuals, Individuals humans, humans, homo humans. sapiens. Yep. And this week, punters and dribblers. Earthlings. Earthlings. Um, we have the great pleasure of joining on the couches Mark Boris, uh, the incomparable mm. Mark Boris. The unsinkable. The unsinkable Mark Boris. The people's champion. Yeah. He's been commonly referred to as the man of the people. Yeah. Uh, the punter's champion. Yeah. Punch bowl kid. Turned good. Turned great. Yeah. Turned wildly successful. Yeah. Uh, he's got his own podcast now. He's a mentor to the to the masses, and it was good to sit down and chew his ear off, Tom, and and see how his mind ticks. Correct. Straight talk and the mentor is two podcasts. We have been on one of them. Uh, feel free to go check it out. But uh, he has scaled the heights of business in this country. He started Wizard Home Loans. You may remember. Uh, the 2005 State of Origin series, uh, and if you don't, then go read a book. Joey John's uh, Game 2, greatest game of a football person ever played. Wizard Home Loans, bang, right on the front. Um, among other things, he's also on the Roosters board, but just a weapon who's done... Weapon things. Weapon things. So please enjoy it, Mark Burris. He's manager aiming um, back in... Um, during COVID, beginning of COVID, and Wollongong had... A red zone, an orange zone, a green zone. You remember? I don't know if you remember the zoning. And um, yeah, yeah. And he was his house was on the side of the street, which is in the red zone. Anyway, so I mean, he could he couldn't leave his house, and uh, he was at that stage. He'd already beat, he beat Holloway once, um, and the Americans, I think, the UFC hated the fact that an Australian guy from Windang, Jim, uh, held the title over America's most beloved. Hero, like yeah. you know, he was a the goat, Holloway. So they said to him, "We're going to put the fight on again in Abu Dhabi, Fight Island." Mm. And in order to get to Fight Island, you've got to go through a whole series of processes to get in Australia. At that time, you had to get a special visa to get out of here, or like a special uh, approval. You had to go through Dutton at the time, who who was the, the boss of um, Home Affairs or whatever you call that department <laughs> ministry. <laughs> anyway, uh, he. Also had to get an exemption to train because you couldn't go to the gym. Right. So he's got here. He's got a situation. He's been said, "We want you to come to defend your title in fight in Fight Island." The fight's on in six weeks' time. If you can't make it, that's fine. We understand how the lockdown's going on. Mm. But what happens to your title yeah, you just, gets you get stripped? You get yeah. stripped. Well, yeah. Uh, so which means two other people have fight for it, and Holloway will probably win that. You got six weeks of train. Get ready. Get all your shit together. All your you know approvals and to get out of the country. So I was able to, you know, what actually happened was I helped out with the, him getting exemptions. So immediately um, got a team together. We had to build up the protocol. So we went to the NRL, found out who the NRL used for their protocols for because uh, there was already a precedent. Um, took that protocol, which was rebuilt for Volkanovski and his team. Um, then gave that uh, protocol to the commissioner for police here in New South Wales. This was done on one weekend. Jesus, Jesus. Then the commission- is this your like lawyer brain kicking in? Yeah, here? yeah. Like, this is where you're getting. Well, because I, I, had, I felt as I had to do this. This guy's an icon for Australia. Mm. He's one of our great sportsmen, but also most importantly, he's a small business guy. He's in the business of you know winning money. Yeah. And like it's unfair that a business person should be constrained from making a living mm. yep. for his whole family. And plus, as an Australian, I don't want to see an Australian lose a title, which we don't know many of. Yeah. Especially at that level. So the commissioner police got onto it. He he saw this and he got, or his team saw this. Said, yeah, this is the same as the NRL type of, um, pr- protocol. Gave to the minister for health. Minister of health gave him an exemption, and basically they all had to live in the gym. Really, all the guys he had to rest with. Ordinarily, he would have gone to Auckland uh, to uh, to uh, city city kickboxing, yeah, city or, kickboxing yeah. pri- prior to the fight, but this on this occasion he couldn't. Did the whole thing here in Australia. Got prepared six weeks. Uh, the day before he left, he still didn't have his approval to get on the plane. Oh wow! Um, I rang the uh, the minister for small business, 
um, and I said to her, look, small business owner, you guys are kidding. He's had the application for, for weeks. Mm. He got the uh, approval literally on the day that he had to fly. Oh Imagine how stressed this is. Oh, he's, he's arriving in Abu Dhabi one week before the fight yeah. to acclimatise himself, to train and you – know, in Abu Dhabi, like a million degrees. It was yeah. freezing cold here in Sydney or in, in Australia. He got there and uh, the thing that gets me most about him is he won that fight and he won because he, you know, it wasn't a convincing wing, a super no, convincing tight. wing. That's the second Very one. Tight. But if you take the circumstances, remember Holloway had been prepping for this for ages. Mm. You take the circumstances – that he was able to remain composed and continue, still continue on to make, acquit himself good enough mm. to win mm. is amazing. Yeah, unbelievable. Amazing. That it is speaks, amazing to It me. speaks to his character as well because I hadn't heard that level of detail before about his preparation. He didn't bring that up. He wasn't he – No, he never makes excuses, yeah. excuses yeah, right? doesn't make excuses. He just goes over there, people go, oh, Holloway won, Holloway won. He's like, well, you know, he didn't, he didn't go, well, this is why – you know, I didn't perform my best. But then when he came back in the third fight and absolutely destroyed Smashed him. him. Smashed that was a real statement. Well, can you like, imagine how much confidence he got out of the second one, though? Yeah. Mm. He probably thought, under these circumstances, yeah. I took it to this guy who was the GOAT, like who was the GOAT, mm. Holloway, and I went to a place called Abu Dhabi, and, and, I, and I only had six weeks to prepare. Yeah, everything stacked. And I didn't go to a city, free, uh, city uh, uh, kickboxing. Auckland's in, in Auckland. I didn't get to do that. I didn't get to do a camp in Thailand with wrestling. Mm. I didn't have Craig Jones helping me out. Like he, you know, is he, he the, is he the BJJ guy? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, which he, which he um, used in the subsequent fights. But it's pretty amazing. Like uh, yeah. the guy, he has a really high intellect. Like he's much more intelligent than most people give him credit for. Um, he's totally committed, mm. and he's fearless. Even after his most recent fight where, in terms of, like, just not making excuses, he was just like, after, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to get some surgery on my arm. Like, it's been giving me trouble, like, this whole fight camp. Like, I just came out and smashed this guy, but, like, my arm's also screwed. And I'm yeah. Get, he's uh, a different animal. He, he actually is sort of a, a, in a proper sense, a real fighting animal. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think Australia gives him enough accolades. Not at all. Uh, not, even if you're not a UFC person, just as an athlete. Why do you think that is? Do you have any well, I, I, opinions? Well, well, yeah, I have. Like newspapers, if you remember when um, uh, the, the premier, the New South current premier, Chris Minns, announced that they were going to bring the UFC to Sydney, mm -hmm. um, they talked about, you know, the front page paper, blood sport, mm. you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm glad, and I'm glad um, uh, Chris did this and pers uh, persisted with it and brought it into Australia. I think there's still a lot of people in Australia still think UFC or MMA is too much of a blood sport, you know, and it is quite blood, bloody, but but at the same time, it's well controlled because they don't have mismatches, not not like, you know, boxing is a lot of mismatches. Yeah. In in the MMA, there's very few mismatches and uh, so, and everyone's sort of pretty even. Yeah. So, and, and the referees, are, are, the rules of the game is you can elbow and all that sort of stuff, so I get that part, but the referees are fully onto it, like they don't, let it go on. No, they'll, for the most they'll part, they'll actually physically seeing, jump on yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. They'll stop and, it. Especially at that level. Yes. Mm. So, and I think the the individuals who who fight these fights are extraordinarily well prepared. Yes. For everything. Yep. So, uh, why is it? Why um, do I th still think that Australians don't recognise it? Because I still think it's uh, has the tattoo of blood sport written. Yeah. Do you think it's like older sensibilities as well? Like where you're seeing so? Because even though with boxing. You know, you get knocked down and it's like stop. You then you can get back up and get your head punched in again and again and again and again. Like if you've got the if you've got a relatively good chin, where at least on MMA, in MMA it does look brutal for the like couple of extra punches you might get in when they're on the ground. And then it, it stopped. And then it stopped. But it feels like the older sensibilities. Like even my old man, I know, and he says he's like, oh fuck, like I can't, I can't look at that sort of stuff. But was it the mayor of Bulungong who like said, oh, I'll never give Alex Volkanovski keys to the city because it's a blood sport. Said that like recently. After his most recent win. Yeah, but that, that's made. Dude, he's an Australian who lives in your territory mm. yeah. and he's trying his hardest to be the best in the world yeah. or maintain himself as the best in the world. How many people have done that? Yeah. I mean, he's been, he's not currently, but he's been the pound for band champion. No, no, world. I think he's back, dude. Is he back? No, yeah, they, thought, no they re announced it after that fight. They said, they, they oh, reconfirmed. Because John Jones yeah. got it again, didn't he? Uh, yeah. And, then and then now I, he's but back again. They re the yeah, yeah, they put him back to the So you see reconfirmed. Okay. Yeah. So, so you've got the pound for pound, pound champion of the world yeah. in one of the fastest growing sports on the planet. 
And out when you, but when you strip back the blood sport bullshit, it's, it's, there's like the level of discipline and commitment and like all these sort of lessons within there. It, it's crazy to me that you aren't acknowledging one of the greatest to ever do it who lives in your own backyard. Yeah, and a bloke who, who used to be uh, um, like 105 kilos oh, no, is no. fighting at uh, featherweight in UFC or MMA, which is uh, 67 kilos. What it's the insane. hell? Yeah, I know. There's hope for me still. I can maybe get down there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he's and we, we went down and interviewed him down there and just struck me as a real community man. Like knew everyone in the cafe, talked to everyone down there, seemed like a humble down to earth guy. You know, totally is. And he's a good family man. You know, he loves cooking. He loves writing books for kids. Uh, it's, mate, like it's he's like just jumped off the cross. Mm. Have you what have you always been into fights? Is it something you got into? Like, because you're still you're still boxing. We were saying before because you were in here doing a potty with James Graham, and I think the boys were saying that when you came in, you're like, oh, I've just broken a rib doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, you actually did. I did bruise rib. Uh, I've always been a fighter. I've, 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 I've fought as an amateur for a long, long time. Oh, really? Most of my life. Yeah, boxing. That is. Yeah. How many fights, Jack? Uh, well, I've had. At least twenty. Oh, right. yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've uh, and I've, then I started fighting again because I'm the New South Wales um, ambassador for New South Wales Police Boxing. So oh. I we we put the cops through, um, you know, train them up and get them, match them up and put them on a fight night on. And, and up until two years ago or three years ago, I fought on every event. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> how long ago? A couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I had my last fight about three years ago. So I fought, oh fought coppers. So uh, <laughs> my last fight was with uh, Gary Jubilin, who runs uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah. podcast, yeah, yeah. Catching Catch Killers. Yeah, Catching yeah, Killers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he won on points, actually. That was the only time that <laughs> I, I, I didn't lose. I never lost the fight in those in those fights. Jube's the only bloke who beat me. And he got me on a – he got he put a real good right hand on me <laughs> – and, uh, and he, and he hit me right in the chin. He didn't knock me out, but they made me, they gave me a standing eight. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think it was in the second round, but, um, I don't remember anything else after that. I mean, I, I kept fighting, I didn't yeah. stop fighting, but I kept fighting right through. But, uh, I still remember, um, I remember because Fennec was in my corner. I was, no, no, Garth Wood was in my corner. Um, right. But I've had Johnny Lewis in my corner and all sorts of people. That's yeah, wild. yeah. I one, one night I fought a, a copper and, and this is I quickly I fought a copper and um, he was the um, commissioner's staff. He was the guy, the guy looks after the commissioner, big tall guy, good guy, and um, and he big rangy guy anyway. In the first round, and uh, Johnny Lewis is in my corner, and um, got, um, the the guy come at me pretty hard first round. Like so, he's throwing throwing about me and punches because I'm a slow starter in the fight. Because I'm, I'm much older than all these guys; they're, they're all younger than me. So. So it just takes a bit to warm up, and uh, so I was like, I just stand in the corner, cop, see if he hurts, and you know, I'll feel his punches, and I was, uh, but he hit me about twenty times. So <laughs> it didn't really hurt me that much. Um, anyway, I got into the corner. John Lewis said, "Listen, son," he said, "If you don't go and knock him out, you're fucked. You're <laughs> <laughs> gonna lose this fight." So I, I went and I knocked him out, and uh, I I hit him in the left. The guy fell, fell on the ground, and um, but on the way down, as he's falling, I didn't mean to do this, but on the way down, I. I I threw another right hand and I hit him in the back of the head. Ooh. And uh, you know how to do that. But, yeah. it, but it's because he's falling. I didn't realise it. And uh, the poor guy, when he hit the ground, he was trying to get up. He was like a baby giraffe trying to get up. He's in <laughs> <been laughs> long legs. He couldn't get up. He'd fallen <laughs> over the joint. And, uh, but he was filthy on me um, for um, hitting him in the back of the head. And he was calling out foul. And, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but, so, but I love doing that. But I don't do it anymore because and that's why I was on Jimmy's podcast, um, Jimmy Graham's podcast, because mm. we were talking about concussion. Yes. And Jimmy and I are on the uh, – uh, the we're on the Australian chapter of a, a thing called Concussion Legacy, and um, that is currently chaired by the uh, uh, Brain Bank here in New South Wales at the RPA Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, and um, and and the head of this thing is a guy called Chris Nowinski, the uh, you know well-known NFL player, well-known uh, fake wrestler. Mm. Who ha is a neuroscientist, um, and but has actually um, he claims to have CTE as a result of being hit in the head. So James and I are quite interested in this territory and mm. trying to help out. I'm on the NRL's committee on concussion mm. protocols. So we meet. In fact, I'm going to see Wayne Pierce after this. Wayne's a chair of that. Mm. Uh, trying to make sure we can build pro good protocols for concussion in Australia. Yeah. I stopped boxing because I went and saw Ruina Mobs. The doctor mobs, yep, and uh, we did a whole lot of testing, and you know there seems to be some sort of um, c c uh, some sort of um, damage that I've uh, uh, that I've incurred, uh, really? uh, incurred like, but it's not from getting knocked out; it's just from getting hit a lot, yes, yep. Rep small yeah. hits. And we worked out that over a period of time, how many times we pro I've probably been hit in the head 
uh, it's just sparring. Mm. You know, if you do five rounds, four days a week, um, and each round that you get on, on average you get hit once and you do it over 30 years, mm. we worked as well. I've been hit that about 20,000 times Jeez. and in the head. So, wow. so I stopped as a result of that. Yeah, and right. now I just do jujitsu. Um, and do you enjoy that? It's one of those things I'm always like, I would like to do it. It seems like it's good fun, although like quite grueling or like quite tough. It's great. Yeah. It, it's, I don't do it. Look, I'm the worst at this MMA gym at Jiu Jitsu. I'm, I'm the lowest person, maybe not lowest anymore, but one of the lowest. I've been doing it for a few years now. Um, but everybody's very good and you can the – think, the thing about Jiu Jitsu is you just tap. Yeah. Start again. <laughs> oh, you got me. You yeah, tap, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can start again. And uh, no one's hitting you in the head. I mean, you can get a few, I mean, like, you know, injuries. Like I was wrestling with one bloke one day and we taught – Unfortunately, he he had his leg caught in my leg, sort of thing, and his kneecap flipped out. Oh, um, that that can happen. Yeah, but generally speaking, I tap before I get to that point. I don't. Yeah, you're not letting press. You dislocate your knee. No, I'm not going to do any dislocate anything. Not that no. racket anymore, mate. <laughs> but it's really good because it makes you think. Yeah. See, for me, what I love about it the most, and I've got a great trainer. He's Larry Papadopoulos. He's a the wrestling coach. Well, he's not really the wrestling. Yeah, wrestling jujitsu coach at the Roosters has been for a long time like a superstar well-known globally when it comes to around the world when it comes to mma and kickboxing um and uh but a really quiet guy and he's just so good like uh, for me to train with I, I just love training but what's really good about it is someone gets me in a position and it makes me think okay i'm in this position don't panic don't let the sympathetic nervous system take over um control that control your cortisol and all that sort of stuff and just now think about how do I get out of that position? What's my next move? And I don't always get it right. Mostly I get it wrong, but still I'm going through this process, cognitive process, and then then I've got to make my body do it. Mm. And as you get older, you realise, you know, something, you, you know, you've got to do some, you've got to move a certain way and it requires your abs to move or something like that and, yeah. or you've got to use your glutes or something. Um, so I find it really important and it's the sort of thing I could do, you know, touch whatever the sort of thing I could do till I'm 90. Yeah. Because right. you're always learning. And uh, yeah. I, I love it. I just love it. I just, it's so good, uh, yeah, but it's hard. Do you see anyone, do you get anyone that's like, I'm going to fucking choke out Mark Boris? <laughs> like, do, you, do people nah, sort of come at you? But, like, oh, but, but the guys from the two to go to the same gym. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so that's, I know Archie, he, he always sends us photos of him sweaty as hell. Yeah, that, Archie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he and, likes uh, to send in sweaty photos. Yeah, he, he, from he, he does a bit of boxing there. Like, yeah. uh, he just went to Thailand and did like a Muay Thai camp. Did he? Yeah. yeah, I think he's pretty full on. Yeah. Uh, he's pretty full on for this sort of stuff, yeah, like uh, for the fight camp. I don't see him on the mats, but I see him in the ring all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, and he's been gloating about his Paramount Plus show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. He said, did you see episode about the yeah, criminal rights? Yeah, yeah, renewed for a second. Yes, dude. Yes, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, it's, it's, uh, but but good on him. Um, but but he, you know he he has a crack at it. Uh, it's, it's so you get to meet lots of different people. But yeah. No one's really tried to choke me out yet because, I mean, there was one guy there who's a purple belt. He's he, you know, he's really good and purple. Pretty he got to be there for ten years to become purple belt and uh, li around that type of territory. He's a young guy, youngish guy, I should say, compared to me. I'm definitely the oldest in the gym, and uh, my God, like he's not very heavy. He maybe seventy five kilos. Dude, like, he just dragdolls me. Like, this, I'm nothing. Like, and like, oh, okay, okay let me out. Let me out of here. You know, I feel like the blood's getting stuck in my brain. Like, it's not flowing to my rest of my body because yeah. it's choking. <laughs> and uh, I remember when I first started, I thought, I said to him, I said, you know, after we finished, I said, look, would you want to step in the ring with me now? Because we'll do some boxing. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, right. You know, like uh, this guy won't be able to box for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but, but 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 problem is, problem is, you get one shot, and if you miss, they come in, they take you down. Yeah, and then, then you're fucked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's very humbling. Yes, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I, it looks humbling. Yeah, it does. I'd be humbled by it. You're in great nick, mate. Yeah, I must it's say. Phenomenal show. Yeah, have, you, have, have you always looked after yourself? Is that yeah, I've always trained all my life. Like, I've yeah. been a mad trainer. Like I do it for mental reasons, like for yes. mental health yeah. uh, training. Um, obviously, I, I do it for ego re as well. I mean, I was to more look hot. Yeah, try, try to look hot. Yeah. <laughs> when I when I was younger, I did it mostly for that, but also did it because it was my mates did it. That was like a thing I did with my mates. Yeah, it's a part way of socialising. Um, and uh, and my generation, 
sort of did that type of thing. You know, you'd, you know, you'd run your budgies in those days and your, you know, T-shirt and, and, and budgies, you know, like from yeah, Bronnie yeah. to Bondi and yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, right. and, uh, <laughs> But I wouldn't fucking do that today. Like, you look, you look like you still could. You probably no, could, I wouldn't though, do it. Yeah. Man, like my, my four sons, you – boys know some of my boys and yep. uh, mate they would give me so much shit <laughs> um, yeah, no I wouldn't want to embarrass them yeah, like that allowed. we are brought to you as always by our good friends at N-E-D-S. Ned's N-E-D-S 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 Ned's who do we like Ned's so Ned's if you don't know they are the betting platform of choice if you do enjoy having a punt then Ned's is where you should do it um They've obviously got all of the uh, the mod cons, the markets, and this and that, and all of the the things that you would want to be betting on. They've also got the private group channel. They're the only betting platform that has the about even private group channel. I can tell you that for free. The only one. Only one. We're the biggest group on the platform. Yes, we are. So if you want to come join the biggest group on the platform, come join the about even group. Yep. On Ned's secret, secret code, code. Dribble up. Or is it dribblers? No, it's dribbler. It's dribbler. dribbler. Don't you worry about that. Thanks, mate. Uh, and we'll see you in there for a little laugh and a chuckle and a pull rah hee hee. Chances are you're about to lose. For free and confidential support, call the number on screen or visit the website. So were you like were you fighting were you a fight fighting inclined or like a fighter's mentality when you were younger like what's and is there like an alignment with business now so like what because you came up in you're from punch bowl right yeah, growing up bowl, yep so was that sort of the mentality having a fight when you were younger or uh, yes yeah, so or no um uh you had to learn to fight like where i went to school like that was and play footy um like it was a very physical environment um in that if you didn't you'd probably get bullied right. pretty bad i never got bullied but you'd probably get bullied um and you know obviously discussions about bullying wasn't a thing at the time like you know you got bullied bad bad luck mm. suck it up mm. um so you either had to respond or get bullied one of the two um and and i think i was lucky that i had a group of mates that were, were more sporty and as a result of that everybody sort of pretty much could handle themselves uh well had and you know not, not as like you know we weren't like um or something like that like we you know but we could we, we'd be able to stand up yep. um that was a thing growing up uh but today the world's changed um I, i'm i fight for what i believe in i have a saying for my my sons and one of my sons got a tattoo on his arm actually so i i say um work play so this is my motto work because work's important for your mind i think play because you've got to give yourself a rest mm. you know you must have a rest and rest for me is play um fight Fight for what you really believe in. Love what's worth loving. And I don't mean that in a hoochie coochie sort of I mean, uh, be passionate about. Love is passionate for me. Be passionate about what you really believe in. And then finally, believe. Believe in something. So that's my motto. Work, play, fight, love, believe. And that's something I developed over my whole life. That, that saying. And when I, I used to travel a lot, I, I mean, I had a business in India for, for years. And I used to gather every six weeks and um, I used to send that on a text to my boys as I got on the plane just before the plane's about to take off mm. just to remind them that's what I'm trying to do. That's how I'm trying to live my life mm. um, because I didn't see them a lot and uh, I just wanted to at least let them know that I had a, a motto why I was doing what I was doing. Yeah. You know, so it didn't look like I was just trying to do it to make money or I didn't care about them yep. When, yep. when I needed to be there sometimes and I wasn't. Um, so yeah, because that, we they grew up in separate separate houses. Like um, they mostly spent their time with me, you know. But nonetheless, it was a tough for them. So and, and even worse that I was hardly ever there. Mm. I always had housekeepers looking after them and stuff like nannies. Um, so I developed that on purpose for myself and for them. Yeah, right. And was that, I guess, like where does that mentality come from? Like when you're younger, how are you? What experiences shaped your, like, I guess, shaped you in the way to get you to be this sort of very business orientated, but, you know, someone who's, I guess, also self-reflective enough to think about all those sorts of things? Well, it's taken me a long time to work it all out, to be honest with you. Like, uh, and my, my probably more um, thinking about my parents and what they, what they stood for mm. without them having, having actually articulated it to me in words. Um, so it's more reflection on them. Or reflecting upon them, mm. 
um, and what was good for them, what worked for them. Um, one of my parents is still alive. Um, my mother passed away, but just like seeing what worked, um, like working hard. Mm. Yeah, it's good for you. Yep. It's actually good for you. Um, it's not, you know, like if you, I want those people to tell you, I don't like working hard because it's whatever. I mean, that's, that'll send you into a life of distraction, looking for distractions and excuses. Um, so I see work as an ethic. The ability to work is like a blessing, physical ability to work. Um, turn it to work every day. That's the first thing. I mean, I, uh, 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 my mother always was, she had a saying, all work, no play makes Johnny a dull boy. Um, you've got to have a proper balance in that regard. And by the way, I'm not one of these guys who's got a perfect work-life balance. It's about backfilling. Yep. Fuck, I worked really hard. Last couple of weeks, I haven't seen anyone. I better go and reach out to my mates mm. or I better go and do something with the boys. I'm not, I'm not Mr. Perfect. I'm the opposite. I'm sort of backfilling all the time, but I do backfill. I recognise I've got to play. So, go And that was something my mother gave me. So my father worked his butt off his whole life as, a, as an immigrant in this country. No skills, no school, couldn't speak English, just worked hard. I get it. My mother was always telling me, make sure you put time into, you know, balance your life out. Just don't always work. You've got to – otherwise you can't work all the time. Mm. And then in terms of um, – beliefs and uh you know fighting for what i believe in my mother was um, really passionate about causes things that are important to her in the world and uh so i i sort of developed that you know fight love so, uh, fight love sort of those two, two opposites but they're the same in my view yep um they require the same amount of level of energy and um, i got that from her and then believing you know i i just think belief I believe in something. I mean, I I don't care whether it's Buddhism or Catholicism or Muslim or Jew or what. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. No, well, none of those. Just believe in nature, or the universe. I, mm. I couldn't care less. But believe in something. Mum was always saying, "You got you know, beliefs an important thing." Mm. And she was Irish Catholic, like she was pretty full on. But I know it served her well. You know, it, it's more a service to you. Mm. A belief is not because you're worried about going to heaven or hell or mm. purgatory or whatever. It's a belief, I think, serves you well. Yeah. And and uh, it certainly served my mother well, and um, it sort of serves me well too. Do you think that sort of sort of mindset ha goes hand in hand with your entrepreneurial spirit? Like where did that come from? Because Tom and I sort of, we've run, we've got this business there. I've run a couple of businesses in the past. It's very addictive once you start, at least in my opinion. Have Were you always that way inclined or did you just fall into it? through sort of happens change. Yeah, I'm I'm um, obsessive sort of person. Yeah. So, and I'm on a mission, so I believe in it. Like, like Yellow Brick Road, I believe in people should be able to get home loans and not have to grovel for one. Um, I, I reckon every Australian deserves to have a roof over the head somehow. Um, so my big deal is uh, once I believe in something like that, I become obsessed about it. I'm obsessed about the belief. And I don't know whether it's me talking myself into the thing I believe in, and justifying why I believe in the first place. I don't know the answer to that question, but I've always been that person. So I, I'm not, I mean, I, I love entrepreneurialism for the nation. I, I think it's a great thing for the, the nation. It's great to have entrepreneurial spirit, spirit, but that's not what drives me. What drives me is the thing I'm doing that I believe in it. And I, then I become obsessed about making it happen. So, uh, and I, I, I'm, I have a big fear of failing. I, I get nervous about things like that even today, um, even at, I'm 60, my next birthday I'm 60 out, right? So I, I think, I'm like, why the hell are you fucking worried about it? Like, don't, you've done enough. You don't have to prove anything, prove anything to anybody. But I just get nervous about well, what happens if I, I don't succeed or something yeah. happens, something changes. Mm. And, and it actually gets me, mm. gets to me mm. in my gut, yeah. in my stomach. I yeah. can feel it. Does you, is, that, so is that like even when things are going well, I find sometimes I do this and obviously we're in a, significantly different level you and i mark but well yeah but you're a young guy like yeah. compared to me when i was your age no, we're not at different levels but so but but did you still have that feeling where so like when things are going well i'm still always like let's make sure it doesn't fucking go bad though like yeah. you know you're like that's the sort of thing sort of like you don't it, want it, it to it, end or stop or go backwards well it's it is it's not quite imposter syndrome you know where i feel mm. as though i don't deserve it but i sort of have this view that why do I deserve to be successful any more than anybody else? In mm. like, like I'm not special. Um, 
my kids think I'm special. Special, Dad, you're a bit special. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm but I'm actually not special. Like and uh, in my mind, mm. so but particularly other people see me that way, and uh, that that doesn't bother me. But it sort of just confuse me. I understand how people benchmark everybody. I get all that, but people don't know me. I'm not. I'm actually not special. Mm. I've, I've been lucky. Um, I take opportunities, um, but I do obsess about not making a mistake. Mm. I don't want to fuck anything up. Yeah. I just don't want to do it. I just don't want to leave that as my legacy. And is there I, anything there? Sorry to interrupt you, but that you have fucked up. Like, is there any? Is that rooted in anything, or is it just the general sense of not wanting to fuck up? Like, is there something that's happened where you're like, oh, I don't want to feel this again? Well, I was lucky. I worked when I was twenty five or twenty six. I worked in a law firm till I was about early thirties. And I, we had like the top of the town when it came to entre entrepreneurial clients like Alan Bond, all sorts of, all those names, okay? And I don't think of all those famous people at the time, not one of them, apart from the fact that a lot of them passed away, but like none of them really lasted very long. And I saw a lot of, a lot of those great entrepreneurs who were great entrepreneurs, great visionaries, um, lose their legacy over p short periods of time so it didn't cost me anything i learned unbelievably um important lessons and uh that stood by me and uh I'll, I'll never forget some of the disasters that we were involved in as a firm trying to rescue people going to prison because of it you know like you know like corporate not crime but like cor corporate malfeasance you know mm -hmm. these sorts of things and uh usually driven by desperation to make sure they can hold the thing that they've developed or they've envisioned or or, or created yeah just out of desperation yep. and not knowing what to do um not many of them were quite really evil sinister people but some did go to jail some um just died you know through illness and i'm always a firm believer like that a lot of the diseases get caused by putting yourself in extraordinarily stressful situations mm. when shit's going down yeah so I saw a lot of that. Not never really happened to me personally. Lucky because I saw it. But when you're, what what are you seeing specifically? Is it like, is there is there something? Is there a general trend or a decision that's made that puts these companies in bad positions that whereby they have to make uh, decisions out of desperation? Is it greed that gets them to a, a tipping point? It's definitely greed. Yeah. Um, I think um, naivety, um, naivety as to how markets react or people react. It's also partly not having, not relying on history. So don't think you're better than history. You know, these shit happens to everybody. Markets turn, markets change. There's change, there's cycles. And you don't control any of that. Some of these people, unfortunately, they, egos get so big that they think they can change the course of history. And for me, history just repeats itself over and over and over again. And for those people who don't, um, I'm prepared to take notice of what history has done in the past, then you're heading for a problem. Ego is a big part of it. And I, I mean, everyone's got an ego, but I don't really have an ego. Um, I'm not doing it for any particular reason. I'm not doing it because I want to be better than anybody else or I want to have a shiny car. I mean, I drive a Toyota. I mean, mm. I, I don't care. Yeah. You do. I've seen it. Yeah, you've seen it. That's right. Helping Parkers not lying. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I, I, I don't care. But now, I have been through periods where, I, to me, the status was important because I never had any status. Mm. I had zero status. Growing up where I grew up, I'm going to school, I went to school, I had no status. For, for a fleeting moment, I, for a period, short period of my life, it was a big deal. But also I had people in my family who would slap me down, not literally, but slap me down, put me back in my place. And my, my mother's Irish roots, like – you know, don't have tickets on yourself, Mark, because if you stand the wind, they'll all blow off, you know, <laughs> that, that type of stuff, yeah. you know, because things change. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, I got brought up in that environment. Don't, don't think you're better than anybody else. And then I saw other people, as I said, I witnessed other people, their egos get ahead of them. And, uh, and, and by the way, egos, you know, like uh, as Shirley says, ego is not a dirty word, you know, out of the skyhooks. It's not a dirty word. Mm. Um, we all have it. It's a matter of knowing when to use it, not use it. And, um, you know, over time I've worked that stuff out just through observation. I, mean, I, I was lucky. I was put in positions where I could observe other people's downfall and re sort of reflect on it over time, over long periods of time. 
to make sure I don't make the same mistake. Yeah, right. When you were in, so you're working with a law firm, when do you then go and try to start? Is Wizard the the next thing you do outside or the first thing you do outside of the law firm? Uh, pretty much. I, it was probably about two years out, out of that. Um, you know, when I was 31 or two, um, I had a son to, to a previous wife, a former wife. I had another son, um, Alex, to then my current wife. And within 18 months, she was pregnant again with, with Nick. So I had... Shout out to Nick. Shout out to Nick. Friend of the show. I know Nick. Friend of the show. And uh, so I had three, three kids um, and I just left the law firm. And um, I was at a pretty low place in my life because I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I'd always worked in structured environments. You know, law firm clients come in, you charge per six minutes, you get paid the bill, you get paid your fee, blah blah blah. Next client, you know, that's how it worked, and that and I've been doing that for years. And um, I now went into this world where I had to fend for myself, and uh, and I'd never been in business for myself, so I had to think about what I was going to do. And um, I, I, you know, like I, during that period, you know, kids had to feed, ex-wife had to pay maintenance to, I had to look after my son, who at the time was living in France, my oldest boy. Um, and you know, there was money transfer. Like it was just a nightmare for me, to be honest. With you. Like, and when I think back, I probably was depressed, but, but not clinical, but just down. And uh, yeah, just trying to get my life together was uh, really hard. And the wizard opportunity came up, uh, so I. I've just met these, these uh, one, two, three. There was three guys, um, who uh, four guys, I should say, who had a mortgage broking business, mm. and uh, and it was called Mortgage Acceptance Corporation or something like that. I don't know what it was called, something like that. Um, and uh, they had an office in North Sydney, and I needed some funding for a property that I wanted to develop along with my another bloke, because I was trying different things, and uh, we couldn't get the finance. You know, I, I couldn't borrow any money and um, we had to settle on this property and these guys come along and did the deal for me. And I thought, wow, that was pretty cool. <laughs> How good was that? It looked like it was really easy. <laughs> and John Simons had just kicked off, Aussie. And I said, and I knew John quite well, still do. And um, I thought, I wonder if these guys could do what John's just done. So I went to them and I said, why don't we try and do it? Um, let's have a crack at this. I, I, I have a master's degree as well in um, capital markets. So I understood how the back end worked, right. like the funding side of things, yep. quite well. And uh, and I always specialise in banking anyway in all my professional career. Um, so I knew pretty much the, the processes. So um, yeah, I, these guys here, yeah, okay. So uh, I bought in, I sold my house. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> With wow. three kids. Yeah. 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 And uh, <laughs> took the equity and bought in and funded this little business. Mm. And changed the name to Wizard and uh, funded this little business I mean, today, if you are knowing what I know t today, I probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> but then I was a bit more fearless and, uh, but I'll probably a bit more, not desperate, but I had to do something. Do you think there's an element of that that you need to, like, not necessarily need to, I guess, but in a lot of things, when you want to have a crack at something, it's sort of like you got to jump off the cliff a little bit. Yeah, totally. You got to yeah. put, you, uh, and sometimes you need to be, even be pushed mm. um, and see if you can sort of fly a bit, you know, like, because, uh, I wouldn't do it today because I'm more defensive today. Like I've, I've got more things to lose, so I probably wouldn't do it. Um, and I've got less time to make it up. Mm. But then I, I do remember thinking to myself that just if it whole thing turns to shit, you go back to work and yep. just go back to what you used to do. Mm. Yep. And six minutes charge outs, you know, like I didn't really want to do that, but like I could if I needed to. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, selling my house at the time, my God, and uh, taking the equity out, and I didn't have much. It wasn't like a, it wasn't millions. It was it was like less than half that. Um, and most went to this. Most of it, most of the money I got from the proceeds of the sale, the net proceeds of the sale after paying my mortgage back, went into um, paying for the state of origin sponsorship. Right. right. So that was your big. That was your big one. Two hundred fifty grand. Of per, the, per year. Yep. Yeah, was and I had to draw a check. Like literally that day, wow. was, I, the state of origin opportunity came up five days before they were playing on the Wednesday night. What year what, was the first year you started sponsoring? Shit, was it ninety eight? It's it's actually though like 
for me, one of the most memorable sponsorships sort of in Australian sport. And I mean, maybe Joey 05 or whenever it was has th- a lot to do with that. But like, I think, yeah, I think Joey. Front of the, it was a, it was a great one, right? Like 10 you years. look back on that as going like, that was a great fucking investment. Well, well, it, it's, uh, and like, but I had to talk to my, my wife at the time about it. Like, um, cause you know, I, I might've, I don't mind saying, I might've had 450 grand net out of the sale of my property after I pay the mortgage. And uh, we were renting a house from that point on, and um, two hundred fifty grand out of that four hundred was went straight one check straight to New South Wales Rugby League, and uh, it was a big bet. Yeah, and I and uh, and I said, look, I reckon this will this will elevate the Wizard um, brand better than anything else I could do. Um, and then, like I mean, David Ginge will sort of was helped me out. Like so, Ginge was really good on that in that regard. And um, you know, I had the backing. Well, I, at that stage, I didn't have the backing of the Packers. They had, they weren't investors in '98. They become investors in '99. But in '98, Ginja was my mate, and he was sort of helped me out. Mm. And uh, and I had and, and people like Nick Politis and Colin Love, who was the chairman of the NRA, of the New South Wales Rugby League. I had a lot of sort of people I knew. Were these all relationships you've developed through your being a lawyer? Like, is nah, that sort of, no, no. Just... Colin Love was a lawyer, but um, I knew. I can't remember how I knew Colin back in those days but it's quite heavy hitters that you yeah, served, yeah. you know like well politis um um i met through ginjal um ginjal was a mate of mine from just around these suburbs okay yeah. right. um you know and he was in those days young really young guy like he was he's 10 years younger than me so i would have been 40 something and he was 30 something mm. and uh sort of you know pretty loose i don't mean as a bad guy but like you know just doing his best yeah. you know, <laughs> as I was. And, yeah. uh, and we had a great friendship. Like we used to train every day with each other and meet each other in the morning. We talk about, and you know, it's, it's funny, you know, you probably, you guys probably do it when you're younger and you got a, you got a mate or a, in your case, partner, you, you, uh, you talk shop a lot. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a lot of energy involved. So we used to go from run from Bono to Bronny back. And, um, in the mornings so we just talk about the work the whole time. And, uh, you know, one little good thing drops out of it maybe once a week, but that's pretty important. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. You just talk a lot of shit and, mm. uh, but eventually you get something out of it because you've got to keep, you know, I keep saying there's a, for me, the most successful people I've ever met are prolific at what they produce in relation to the business. Maybe if it's a podcast, they produce a lot of podcasts or um, if it's that you're writing articles for the, the AFR, you produce a lot of articles and you might put online articles. You just, you just produce a lot. Yep. Mm. And it's about being prolific in prosecuting your thesis, whatever it is. And Ginjal was incredibly important to me, to, for me to have someone to talk to. And he would, and he, and by the way, he just wasn't someone I talked to. He'd talk back to me. Like we'd talk about the, the thing about marketing the business. Cause you know, home loans, there's no money dollars. There's no designer dollars. Mm. A, desi- a dollar from Wizard is the same as a dollar from CBA. Yes. No, yeah. no one gives a shit. You give it to me <laughs> at the right price and yeah. tell me it's for 25 years or 30 years. Yep. That's all I want you to do. You can have a mortgage over my property and I'll pay back every month for the next 30 years. No designer dollars. Mm. It's all about how you market your your offering. What is it you're, you stand for? Yeah. And Ginger was a great reader of marketplaces, of people, and uh, still is. And um, – you know, which is why he sold. That's why those guys, not just him, but Mick Fanning, all those guys, they sold Bolter for so much money. Yeah, they read the market. I mean, look at the packaging. Yeah, that beer is mm. unreal. Oh, it's spot that, on. It's so good. Yeah, it's really good. It's it's just like you couldn't. Yeah, you, you couldn't fault it. And they it. did pretty well out of it. Too. Oh, they <laughs> <laughs> they smashed it out. Yeah. Of the but park, so, you know? what was Ginjal's read back then on on how to place Wizard in the well, marketplace? He, he, it's about he he used to say it was about help. Yep. So, and if you remember the NRMA, then come up with that. They still have it that that the help logo. Yep. You know, it's, yeah, another one. Yeah. It's really important. You know, borrowers just want help. He said, mate, they, they don't care about the interest rate. They just want someone to go and help them get because it's about getting that property. How do I get that joint? Mm. Can you help me? Mm. Are you willing to help me? And bear in mind, at the time, that this is the dot com boom, the tech boom. So banks were closing branches down left, right, and center. Like if you think they're closing branches down a lot now, they were closing down at a far greater pace then. Really? Yeah, because um, because they all thought that borrowers are going to borrow online, and what's the point of having a branch? Mm. Like, and it started in '98, '99 that period, 
And David said, you know, Mark, people actually still want help. It's the biggest thing they buy in their life, most people, the house. Mm. Yeah. It's the biggest transaction you do financially. And uh, so he said, why don't we open up branches when banks are closing them? So what we stood for is banks closing, we're opening. Right. And uh, we just had to work out a way that it wasn't too many overheads, didn't cost too much. So I come up with this idea of franchising people. And um, so the branch owner was a branch owner and they had their own branch and they paid the bills. We supplied the marketing and we supplied the, the funding. The, what I mean by the funding, the product. Yes. The loan. Mm. And, uh, and the branding and all the back end. They just paid the, they paid the rent, they filled the, the branch up and they went and found the client or dealt with the client and they gave them help. Like real people talking about what you really want. Actually sitting down with you, looking to you in the eyes and say, yeah. okay, what, what is it you're trying to do here, mate? Uh, we are buying. Oh, that's interesting. We just had a person down the road buy one in there. Yeah. Bank managers didn't even exist. And if they did, they weren't that interested. Mm. So our game was to show you that we're actually interested in talking yeah. to you and we actually want to help you. A personal touch. That was Ginjal's call. We got, to, we got to be standing, promoting, we're here to help you. And it's still... It hasn't changed. Mm. It hasn't changed. I'm just thinking now, as you're saying that, of a mate of mine who's in Ascent Finance and he does well through what you're talking about, a personal touch, helping yeah, people. Totally. Yeah. You know, like um, my younger son, who, who, who you guys might know, I think you know him, Jimmy. Yeah. Um, he, he works in one of our branches and uh, I said to him, I said, mate, and he looks like he's 12. Um, but <laughs> So I said, mate, at the end of the day, if you can convince someone, don't worry how young you look, if you can convince someone, you're going to go out and go on a bat for him and you're going to help them get the answer that they need, mm. you'll be okay. You just need to spend more time on that. Yep. Continually ring them. I mean, the biggest problem now, if I ring a bank, not me, but if someone's ringing a bank, you won't, you'll get an a, a, a interactive voice response. Yep. You don't get a person. If you do, they don't come back to you for ages. You don't know who to call. You don't know what they look like. You don't know where they're living or sorry, where their office is. You don't know anything. I said, mate, if you, they know where you, your office is in the city, and you say, I'll come and see you wherever you are, and or, and this is where the deal's up to, or this is why the deal is taking a bit longer, just talk to them, you'll do well. And uh, that that has not changed. People still need help. When did the idea of the sale sort of, of, of Wizard come about? And, well, just to answer, I'd get to that first, like how that sort of uh, came about, and then I'll well, a couple other. Well, it, it was uh, sort of like Kerry, because... Uh, we were partners, um, he owned, we owned half each of the business and um, at that stage, I remember having a meeting with him one day and I used to meet him all the time because he was quite interested in the business and uh, he said to me, uh, son, um, how much money do we owe in Wizard? I said, oh, uh, $19 billion. <laughs> <laughs> he went white. And I said, but don't worry, I said, we got $19 billion worth of assets. He said, I couldn't give a stuff about the assets. He said, $19 billion of the borrowing. I said, yeah, but they're matched. They're, well, that was my job to keep, you know, like in a treasury sense, like uh, that was my game is matching things and making sure that the assets match the liabilities and that um, as the liabilities became due, in other words, we have to pay our liabilities with the money because we went to markets around the world mm. um, in those days raising money. And people talk about raising money. I raised $19 billion worth of money Jesus. in 2000 from – uh, nine, from 2000 to 2004, 19 billion. And uh, I raised it in, in the US, in Europe, and in the UK, and Australia. Not much What's Australia. that look like? You know, like what are you, you just like rocking up to people and going, hey, this is what I'm doing. Like, need a couple of billion, man. Yeah, you got to spend Well, Tom, billion. I can tell it probably took me um, initially, I probably had 30 trips before I would raise a dollar. Okay. And I would always have. Someone, so we appointed what they call leads. So we'd have, we had Deutsche Bank in the US would take me around to all the big, the big funds. And then we had Abe and Emro in the UK and Europe, take me all around the big funds. In Australia, we used um, Westpac, take me around to all the funds. And that would just knock on doors, tell them what we're doing, tell them how we raise them, uh, sorry, how we lend money, um, to explain to them uh, how we can get diversification in terms of socioeconomics and uh, geo graphic economics so you know you, there's no concentrated risk you know we're not just lending people in sydney we're lending people in ballon and sydney and melbourne like you know all those sorts mm -hmm. of variables they like to see so you're you just spend time with them and uh but it means you've got to get fly overseas and uh because the markets aren't weren't in those days weren't deep enough here in australia 
Um, that's what <laughs> that's what it meant. And when I and 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 I did that for years. That was my, my main job. Everyone thought I was the marketing guy. I'm not. Mm. Never have been. Mm. I was the guy who sat at the back, making sure we had the money. Because you know, like we can make as well as you like, but if we can't lend the money, if we don't have it, it's no point. You know, we just, we're going to have the disappointed customers. Can't yep. I can't lend you? So it was a constant thing. Every six weeks, I go over and raise a billion dollars, <laughs> US. <laughs> sometimes it was in pounds. Sometimes it was in sterling. Sometimes it was in euro. Sometimes it was US. Sometimes it was in all three. Then I was paying interest rates in US interest rates, uh, European interest rates, euro interest rates, and um, uh, sterling interest rates. But I was lending money in Australian dollars and Australian interest rates, so I had to have match. I just used to have to have very comp. We had very complex um, uh, uh, contracts with organisations to cover us the differentials because things change and move around all the time. So, you know, we'd have hedge contracts everywhere. So I, uh, every uh, every six to seven weeks, um, do you become desensitised to that sort of the numbers, like to like that you're dealing yeah. in billions? Like yeah. It just sort of becomes like numbers. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Are, are you coming? Are you doing all this yourself? Or have you got people advising you or helping you? Yes, so I had. Seems a, I complex. built a treasury team. I you built, built a team of treasury. There's right. a whole group in my business. Yep. And I've got it in my current business too, in the Yellow Big Road. Same, but we would appoint in all the territories. We would appoint Deutsche Bank in the US, so they would take us through what I might have to go and see Merrill Lynch. They might have been one of the investors. Or Bill Gates Foundation was a big investor, for example, or PIMCO. And they would tell us what they're looking for in terms of data and information and performance and all those sorts of things. So we would make sure that our stuff suited those particular clients. Sure. So we were constantly getting downloads of information, or I was, or the team was, and then we would go and see these organisations and just keep raising dough. Mm. And to answer your question, Kerry got uh, – he said, look, Mark – he never called me Mark. He called me other names, but never Mark. And uh, he said, 19 billion, he said, like, if something goes wrong, he said, I can't afford that. He said, we'll be stuffed. Mm. And, and I said, but the assets, everything's matched. And I said, we've got, hedge, we've got hedged in contracts with everything. So I've hedged every single thing. I book match everything. Mm. Interest rate variance, prepayment speeds, uh, 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 currency changes, currency, you know, like changes, you know, when we were repaying back the Americans, you know, we'd have a currency exchange. Um, it was everything's book matched. He said, "Yeah, but who's book matched? Who's who's uh, who are the hedge funds? That, who's sorry? Who are the banks who are hedging these contracts?" And I told him who they were. I won't say their names now, but they were big banks. And he said, "How do you know they're going to be good for it?" I said, "Gary, come on, like you know, the biggest banks in the world. Some of these organisations." He said, "But what happens if we have some sort of financial crisis? This is in two thousand four. Jesus Ooh. Christ." And I said, oh, it's not going to happen. You know, like, uh, are you kidding me? Like, oh, you know, I mean, this is the, where the what wisdom. A, what a visionary. Yeah, yeah mate, that's wisdom. <laughs> that's yeah. fully wisdom, right? Yeah, that's yeah. unbelievable. And uh, he said, you know what, son? He said, might be time we consider offloading this, you know. And we'd had a, a property boom in Australia uh, around that period or just before that period. And he said, it's probably the best time now is because the property market might drop off a little bit. And I wasn't not a person who cared about selling so much. It never came to me. Um, you know, I was just happy to keep building it. And uh, so we, I put it to one of the, we had a, we, it's complicated, but we had this, we had to insure every mortgage so that it, it was less risk when we would come to selling the mortgage bonds overseas every six weeks. The organization we used to insure the, the pools of mortgages, and we're talking about, you know, a billion dollars at a time, was a, a mob called General Electric. They owned a business here in Australia called, called Gemico. And it was a big, one of the biggest mortgage insurers. And um, so I went and saw them and I said, look, we're your biggest client in Australia. Are you interested in buying us? Um, and they said, yeah, we are. And I didn't really know much about General Electric. I mean, I, did, I, mean, I knew that Thomas Edison established General Electric in the 1850s. It's about all I knew. Mm. But I knew they were a big jo joint. And... Uh, but I didn't realise that they were a, a very acquisitive place. They bought lots of stuff. And um, seven months later, we sold out. We sold to them seven months later. What's that process like of the, the, the negotiations? Oh, my God. Is, does Kerry play a big role there? No, zero. Zero. Oh, really? And is it stressful as fuck? Unbelievable. <laughs> like, uh, Mate, yeah. I, don't, I would I reckon I'd pass out it's, daily. Yeah. Well, I nearly did a few times. Like, it's, I'm lucky. I'm, I got my brother. <clears throat> so my brother was a lawyer. Um, but at the time, he was a uh, managing director of ING Bank, uh, my, my younger brother. Um, and he's a gun, like absolute animal mm. <laughs> gun. And Kerry said, well, whatever happens, son, uh, we can use all the external law firms that we, you know, you know, we usually use. He said, but I want your brother running it. 
your brother's got to run. Yeah. Um, and, just uh, recognise that he had that. Oh, in him. he's a killer. Yeah. And uh, you know, some people don't like him in business because he's pretty direct and he's like super smart, doesn't miss a trick. Mm. Some people refer to me and him. I cut he sows. <laughs> you know, and you've got to have that. It's a great partnership. Yeah. I didn't realise, but yeah. I'm good at. And but he's good at. <laughs> on the way through, you know, because I leave a lot of bodies around. So <laughs> put around. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so Kerry said he's got to do it. So I said, okay. So, so to answer your question, my brother wore a lot of the stress, um, like because he got into the, the minutia, the detail. Yep. Yep. That's where the stress comes. Yes. That's the shit that wakes you up at two o'clock in the morning. I mean, he and I had some massive blues during this period, like because at some stage there, I thought he was got, he was. He gets so fanatical about a point, one point out of a thousand points, that he won't let go, and he will negotiate until he's in a ditch. <laughs> and I would say, mate, fuck it off. <laughs> I don't care about that point. Yeah. You know, look at how much the money is. That number there, that's fucking nothing. You know, and don't blow the whole deal because of it. Like yeah. uh, that's his style. He will, and and his opposition with two big, really big law firms in Australia, his opposition was equally sort of robust in their, the way they will prosecute something down to the ditch as well. And what you could end up happening is, ha happening is you got two big, big egos, intellectual egos, like clashing. And uh, often I had to sort of come in and, and, and me and him as a massive blueser. Like I'll be, I remember one time I was sitting in the basement of the car park just fucking yelling at him, <laughs> you fucking imbecile! Like, like uh, and like, and he's my younger brother. Like, and it wasn't cool. Like, I mean, but that's the stress. It was like, For sure. like, because I wasn't going to go to Kerry and say, "Mate, we blew the deal." No, yeah. like that that's because be uh, you're not going to find another buyer, no. especially whenever other other people know that you blew that deal. Yeah, well, word would get out. Yeah, like, mate, gets out like yeah, in away. a second. But and most of the other buyers, bigger buyers. Would have used one of the two of these law firms anyway. So was it any was it at any point close to falling over the deal? Um, well, yeah, it's funny. The the, the yeah, I, 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 so the very last day we had or every deal I've ever done always comes down to two or three things that are outstanding, and they're usually conditions they want or warranties that they're looking for for you to you know guarantee something. And they're a big organisation. I didn't realise at the time, but they were the world's largest company. They were, <laughs> their market capitalization in on the Dow Jones index was greater than every company in Australia on the Australian stock exchange added up together. Wow. wow. Okay. So huge. Huge. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and they were meeting on a on a certain day. So on a, let's say it was a, a Friday morning. They were meeting to ratify the acquisition, but if it wasn't solved. They were going to walk. Fuck. So, and there's three things outstanding. And uh, so our, my brother and the law firm that we were using, a small law firm, and I'll shout out, a little firm called Lander & Co, um, um, hosted a meeting with the guys from General Electric and their law firm. So they had one law firm in the morning and they bought a second law firm in the night. They had two massive law firms, right? And they, <laughs> there were 10 of them. And uh, hosted in a boardroom, and we sat and talked about these three matters, and it got into a shouting match, like literally shouting match. My brother's standing over the table, yelling and screaming at people, <laughs> and uh, and you know these. So the boss of General Electric in Australia was in the meeting, and General Electric Australia wasn't just finance; it was just everything. You know, MRI machines, like, uh, like they do everything. Okay, and he said, Mark, he said uh, the board's meeting in seven hours, this is like seven o'clock at night, seven hours time, and they, they're going to walk if we don't, we don't resolve these things. He said, so what I thought he said to me, what I thought we'd do is, is I'm going to get my boss, who was the chairman of General Electric globally, right, to ring Kerry Packer to resolve these issues. I thought, fuck. One on one. This is bad. <laughs> and Kerry that's bad, right? Like you don't want to, in, you don't want to, I don't, to be involved. It's no, I de like definitely don't. And I, but not only that, I don't want Kerry to say he solved it, but equally, I don't want Kerry to blow it either. Because yes. he's just like, so go, he, he, Kerry's just like, say, I'll flip you for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something yeah. weird like that, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I thought, oh, but is he bluffing me? I thought, that's a big call. You know, the chairman of General Electric 
ringing Kerry Backer up. Mm. It's a massive call. So I said, uh, well, that's okay. And they, there's a big gamble. I said, uh, I'll get Kerry on the phone now. Let's call your chairman. And he goes, over to his lawyers, comes back. Look, Mark, can, can we just step outside for a moment? <laughs> outside the room. I said, okay. So we walk in a room and, he's, and there was little lawyer groups in all the offices, all the spare meeting rooms. Because we had, There was a ton of lawyers there, right? And accountants. There was no spare room to talk. So we went in, in those days, I don't know if they still have them, but there was a compactus room. You know, a compactus room. It's a room where you have all the files and there's these sliding filing systems. Yeah, oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. It's a yes. little room, right? A little room with the files in it. So we walked into the compactus room. <laughs> it's like, you know, three by nine <laughs> wide, right? We're standing in the room with files. He said, um, look, he said, no need to get Kerry to ring uh, <laughs> uh, his, his chairman. He said, uh, why don't we resolve them, the three issues just between you? He said, I'll give him one and you give him one and we'll resolve the third one. He said, so I said, well, okay, which one do you want to give me? He said, I'll give him, he said, I'll give him number one condition. I said, okay, I'll give him number two. And then number three, we fucked around and in the end we sort of split it down the middle and resolved it. It was like, like that. So I said, oh, perfect. So we came out, all issues resolved, deals done. I signed, they signed, their board met, ratified the deal. We had a pref. They wanted to do a pref- press conference nine a.m. in the morning, so I just, I stayed up the whole night just because a bit of shit to do during the night. We we're up the whole night. Um, about seven o'clock in the morning, I decided to go to have an exercise because I knew I had to do a press release at nine. I thought, oh, shit, I look like shit. I feel tired. I go and train. Yep. And it might buff me up a little bit and feel a bit yeah. better. <laughs> so I go into the <laughs> car park at the gym. I thought I better ring Kerry. So I ring him up, and I tell him what happened about them saying they're going to get their chairman to talk to him and I fucking think it was very funny. I said, the deal's done. And he said, good on your son. And uh, then I told him the whole story about how I was going to put him on. And I said, but I bluffed him, you know. Mm. And it was dead fucking silence. And I said, you there? He said, listen, you fucking Greek something. <laughs> he said, if, and you know, his share of the deal was about 120 million. He said, don't you ever gamble my $120 million ever a fucking game. I said, oh, come on, come on, carry one. He said, well, if that guy had said, yeah, let's put them on together. He said, I'm in hospital. He said, I've just had an operation. He said, last <laughs> night I wouldn't have been in any condition to talk to anybody. And he said, you didn't even bother inquiring what, what my condition was, whether I could talk to anybody. He fucking hung up on me. <laughs> that was it. He just hung up on me. <laughs> So, I, yes, I nearly lost a deal and I, uh, I could have completely lost my partner too. If it, oh, yeah. <laughs> he just hung up on me. He didn't say, well done, congratulations. I'm really happy for both of us, all of us, whatever. Yeah. That's uh, wild. And he's, I imagine relief. Are you like stoked though? Like, I mean, what's that feeling like when you've just sort of gone, wow, like, do you have to go and just like lay in a dark room? Uh, yeah, well, about, uh, so we settled about two weeks later. I had to go to New York to do the settlement because they, they, they were based in New York. Well, they're, they're, representatives were based in New York in the city. So I went to New York, flew over to New York, booked in a hotel, booked in a fancy hotel I never, that I never been, would not normally stay at. I booked in the Four Seasons. The deal wasn't had to settle in Australian time as well. So it was like 11.30 at night. I had to go to their lawyer's office uptown somewhere. I walked up there. New York was pretty quiet. I can't remember what night of the week it was. It was just the middle, middle of the week. Um, I got, you know, got it all done. You know, I got a piece of paper confirming, you know, my share and also share. I walked back to the hotel. Um, I, I, I got a beer out of the fridge and I rang the concierge, ordered a pizza and sat there on my own. And I thought, what the fuck? Like, uh, to be honest with you, it was, it was a relief, um, but it was total anticlimax. Mm. It really? wasn't, wasn't really about what I – wasn't really. It took me a long time to work out what I'd done, um, and and it t- you know, by the way, put me a long time to work out what was important in relation to what I'd done. And it wasn't the check. It wasn't. It wasn't beating or you know doing a deal with General Electric. It was probably more. To be honest, it was more about how I'd built the business. Or all of us had built the business, not just me. How everybody had built the business and all our interactions and. All the good times you've been through, all the shit times you've been through, all the sweat, all the drama, all the stress. The you know I lost a marriage over it. Like it's it's all those things, and um, 
yeah, it was, and and I and I felt a sense of uh, loss as well because um, I now no longer own this thing yeah. that I loved. You know, that was my thing. Um, I mean, they kept me on for a long time anyway because um, you know, as it, they kept me on as chairman, and, and I ended up doing another deal with them. So James and I, James Pack and I, ended up doing a deal with them, and we set up a business in India and other places around the world, and uh, places like uh, Mexico, East uh, uh, West Germany, Russia. Uh, in Brazil, so James and I reinvested money back with GM. We owned a business sixty forty with them around the world, similar sort of business. Right. We opened our fifty eight branches in India. Really? Yeah, right. yeah. Core Wizard. Um, uh, yeah. So, but then the GFC hit and everything stopped. But yeah, I, it was uh, it was a numbness. Yeah, I can actually kind of understand that, especially because there's not like you fucking popping streamers and everything. Sort of, it's like. And being by yourself, by yourself. I was sitting there by myself, by yeah. yourself, not yeah. being able to go and celebrate. Yeah, yeah. but I, but I probably wouldn't have. I mean, I probably wouldn't. Have, I mean, you, th you would think. I would think at the time mm. that I'm only going to go mad. Yes, that's yeah. what I would think. Yeah. You know, I was sort of on my own, like not married or anything like that. You know, you might think, you know, I'd just make a few phone calls, fill the room up, but <laughs> but I but I didn't. You know, I actually had no no interest in that. I was probably exhausted too. We've got a we've got a, a thing that we like a, a routine or a ritual that we like when we celebrate milestones. We like to get a, uh, a, a what is it like a five dollar Woolies mud cake and a bottle of Verve, and then we sit there and we pound mud cake and have Verve. Not big Verve drinkers either. No, but no, no, not big Verve guys. But that seems like a funny sort of match, right? The Woolies mud cake with a with some of Verve. Verve. So if you have a with your next great success, I highly uh, well for me it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a milestone. It was the end. Mm. Mm. That's true. It's different. Yeah, it is different. That's true. It's the end. It was the end, and uh, yeah, and I, I had things to do, but I didn't know what to do. If you know what I mean, it was yeah. uh, the thing that kept me awake every night. The thing that I couldn't wait to get out of bed to do in the morning. The thing that completely occupied my mind every day, seven days a week, for years. Yeah, all of a sudden was sort of over. Mm. I, I was thankful. Don't get me wrong. I'm very gr grateful for what happened and how I did well and all that sort of stuff. We got to get all that. <clears throat> but you know, like everyone goes, "Oh, well, you did all made all this money." Yeah, but that's on one day. I mean, that that's not a mark of success. That's just a measure on the particular day. Yep. It could change the next day. You know, like it depends what you invest, reinvest the money in. There's a there's a whole series of things happen after that. Mm. Like, uh, you know, you get divorced, mm. you give some of it away, like you pay your tax, give give a lot of it away. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole lot of other markers. That determine how good you feel about it. Yeah. So, but, but on that day, that's how I felt. That's that interesting. Night. So fast forward to current times today. Is that is your passion now channeled into you know mentoring small businesses, um, supporting small business, that sort of thing? Is yeah, that, totally. Is that what your great passion is now? Yeah, totally. It is. Yeah, yeah. And also exposing people who I think are good quality people to bigger audiences. Um, Sort of what you do too, like in in a different sort of way. You do it with a bit of comedy, etc. But I don't. But yeah, I, I, my passion is to um, listen to everybody's story. I have two parts to it. So it's one I want to share your story, and I've done it with you guys. Share your story to a, an audience, mm -hmm. and I because I think it's important for people to have an opportunity to articulate the story. But I also do it from a selfish point of view. I like learning about people's stories and what drives them and how they do it. So I have the two podcasts, Straight Talk and Mentor. And Mentor. You came on Straight Talk. Straight Talk for me is more about knowing about the individuals yep. as opposed to knowing about the business story. Yep. And uh, But I'm selfishly gathering data about – I don't mean in a, a digital sense, mm. but it personally gathering information and uh, – I'm learning, and that's my big passion in life is to learn. I mean, I'm you know like I, you know, if, if average male in Australia has four thousand one hundred six weeks in his life. Um, female has more. Um, I've got six hundred seventy six weeks left. Jesus, you think about it that way. Yeah. It's, yeah. So what am I going to do with that? Yep, I'm not going to fucking sit around and you know moan about it. So I'm going to make every week count. Mm. And every week, one of the things I love doing is learning about what drives people, what makes them think about things a certain way. Why do they do what they do? And especially when I meet guys like you, you know, you know my sons. We've done things together in the past. 
um, my young son was telling me about you today, like how you were on a, you know, a, 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 the super coach group, yes. yeah. you know, how he, <laughs> and how he sort of, uh, it gives you shit. I mean, and then <laughs> I like to see how people react. I, like what else is there in life? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, getting pissed. Um, I've done all that shit. Uh, I love my footy. Yep. You know, I love seeing young men play footy and develop into be good people. And I also like to see how guys, young men can change and, and young women too now in the NRLW, how they can change, how sport can change their life and give them a, what may well be a better life for them and their family and their broader family as well. Particularly when we see what, how some of these players look after their mum, like Freddie, I mean, a great example. I mean, I've been around Freddie for a long, long time. He's looked after his mother. He's got a good house. I mean, Freddie's dad was a bikey, and Freddie come from Green Valley. He went to school in Green Valley. I um, mean, you know, it was like even when I was growing up in Punchbowl, kids who went to Green Valley were we thought they were tough. <laughs> so you know, like, and and look at Freddie today. Yeah, he's chilled. Hardly ever drinks anymore. You know, he loves his family. He's got two great kids. His wife Marie is great. They've got a nice house. He's got money. Like it's just so rewarding to observe that. Yep. And that's what drives me these days. I mean, sure, I want to make some money along the way and pay the costs. Mm. I, I like things to pay for themselves. I like to turn things into a business. So my men, my podcasts are businesses, but it's not about how much money I make out of them. For me, it's about making sure they pay their way because that's just a basic thing I'd like to see happen but, but the benefit I get out of it is just crazy I meet so many cool people I met Dylan Al- Alcott the other day the guy's a machine mm. like, he's a beast uh, unbelievable he nearly broke my hand when he shook my hand <laughs> like, shook my hand like yeah I said dude what are you doing like uh what's the exercise you're doing what's your regime <laughs> but uh, the, he's so up I, like he gave me so much energy and this guy, if he wanted, he could be the greatest winger in, his, in, the, in the world. Like when he was born, he had an operation on his back at four days old mm. to remove a tumour. He doesn't give a shit. Mm. He's out there making the best of everything. I mean, like, uh, it's crazy uh, what I get. And it's, I'm, like, it's, you know, it's manna from heaven from my point of view. And that's what drives me. How many times a week or even a day do you get asked to be someone's mentor? Every day. You must just get absolutely, <laughs> especially with the podcast called the mentor, you just yeah. get pounded. And that's why I do the mentor okay. because I get asked all the time and I just right. say, look, I can't be everybody's mentor. I can't be <laughs> anyone's mentor, therefore. So listen to my show. Okay. Because I bring people into my show who are business people and I ask them about the things that, that have lassoed them or the things that they've got around or how do they get, what was the problem that was presented to them through recessions, through – COVID periods, pandemics, through the GFC. I've been doing this for eight years now, so I've covered a lot of territory. And then when people, my guests haven't got covered the territory, I might have covered the territory. I might have seen it. I saw the GFC. So how did how did I survive during that period? And I share. And my game here is to share as much as I possibly can um, to as many people as I possibly can. And that's the only way I can mentor people mm. is by them watching the show called The Mentor. Yeah. That, and I might it not be just working. Be, it, it, like I just we've we spoke about it before. Like it must just be ridiculous. How do you let him down? You just go listen to the podcast. That's what I do. Yeah. yeah. Look, after a while, and you know what it's like. People want to. They tend to think because they hear you talk with lots of things that are relate to you personally. They tend to think they know you. Yes. And that's the nature of social media and podcasts today. They're, they're very. And that's it. That's the game we're in. Yep. That's fine. And they become emboldened. And it's nearly like we give them permission, people permission to talk to us. In fact, we do. So I will listen to them, but I'm also going to be practical. Yeah. I'm not going to say to someone something that I can't fucking do. Yes. I, ca- I can't fulfill the thing that you want me to do. I just can't do it. So I've got to be honest. You don't have enough weeks left. I, don't, I, I literally <laughs> don't. And by the way, and I don't want to spend my weeks doing that. No. And nor should you. This yeah. is, at the end of the day, is my life. Yeah. And I have to be a bit selfish now. But my selfishness is making sure I get something out of it, yep. but I give you something back. Yep. Well, I mean, and then, you know, in terms of the mentor, it's perfect, right? Yeah, totally. You get something out of it, they get something out of it. It's and it's win. free. And it's free. And I'm not charging exactly. anybody anything. So, yeah. like, just, you know, like, if you want to – and you just go through the register, look at all the people. I've, I've had all some crazy businesses in there, some, you know, billion-dollar businesses, some that didn't do so well. Why didn't they do so well? Make sure that you learn from that thing. And I'm just trying to give people a platform to learn off, basically. How'd you get in the whiskey game? Where, uh, where? Well, ah, I wish I had a bottle. I was saying to the dudes, we've got rose for you as well. We're in the rose well, game, I, 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 but you know, we saw. I've seen your whiskey, and I was like, Jesus. yeah, we won uh, Australia's best whiskey 
yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. Did yeah. you really? So we won, yeah, won Australian Distillery Awards. We won um, Australia's Best um, Single Malt Whiskey. Oh, wow. And it's our, only our second batch. You're kidding. Far out. No, we've been doing it for seven, seven years to get back. Of course. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah, but, like, yeah. that's our second batch released. And uh, we we put in – there was 905 um, categories. The Bird, uh, right? Yes, yeah, called The Bird, yeah. My partners are The Bird in Hand. They're quite a famous wine business called The Bird in Hand in Adelaide. Yeah. So they know how to make wine. Um, and they're now in direct competition. Yeah, we they're in direct competition. Yeah. They, guys, don't, they don't do a bad rosé, I'll – I will say that it's not as good as Big Day, but no, no, okay. but I can see Big Day. It's and that's well named too, by the way. Big Day, Thank you. Yeah, have a big day drinking that. <laughs> uh, but 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 but, uh, but I, how did I get to do it? I was sitting down with the Burton Hand guys once in in their um, uh, uh, cellar door in Adelaide, saying oh, I'd always wanted to build my own whiskey brand because my father loves a whiskey, just not much. You drink like one glass because mm. I said I think wine tends to make me a bit sleepy, and I said also you can drink too much wine. And you become part of the drink instead of the drink becoming part of the conversation. <laughs> and uh, I like that. And uh, so I said, whiskey though. On the other hand, you can't drink much, and it you can sit on it for a long time and have a conversation. Mm. It breaks things down. And I said, I'd love to have a whiskey. And they said, we'd love to do it too. We've always talked about it. And I said, well, let's do it together. So that's how it started seven years ago. So we found ourselves a whiskey maker. He's a gun. Um, and as I said, one his whiskey. Which you know it's our formula, but like his whiskey won the best single malt, um, and we finish our whiskey off in um, uh, French oak now Chardonnay barrels. So I get those from the Burden Hand guys. We used to finish off in the Shiraz barrels. Now we're doing Chardonnay. That's the one that won the best whiskey, and um, we we have a whiskey cellar door at their wine cellar door in uh, Adelaide Hills, and uh, we're we're going. We sold out. So oh really. Yeah, we sold the first batch out. We second batch we released on Father's Day, and uh, and my dad loves a whiskey. And uh, I was able to, get, you know, this is pretty cool. But I was able to get my dad to come in our studios. And we did some photos of me and dad, and um, you know, my dad opening the whiskey up and uh, pour, pouring a drink together. And to be honest, with you, like, if nothing, even if I don't make a dollar out of it, I mean, we we might break even each year because you've got to sell a lot of bloody whiskey to make make money because mm. it costs a lot to produce. Um, but even if I just break even. The fact that I can sit down with my dad and do a little thing with videos and him participating with me. Yeah. Like he's nearly 90. He's just standing there in a studio all dressed up. It was a big day for him. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like oh, that, I love that. that. Is yeah. Me, you know, and, uh, and then I took him next door and I bought him a spinach sandwich and <laughs> salt all over and olive oil over and he thought – I dropped him home. He thought he thought it was Christmas for that. Like, so so good. Like uh, it was a big outing. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. That's good stuff, mate. I'm conscious of time. You gotta we gotta let you go. But um, look, it was great to chat. We could have fucking we could have kept yarning. But uh, thank you very much for coming in. You're most welcome, guys. Um, thank you for having us on yours as well. We really appreciated it. And uh, I guess we'll we'll see you around. Well, I I, I want to say to you guys, like I'll be honest, with you, like and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, okay? You two guys and your team. Clearly, as a team involved, you do a, in your category. You do a brilliant job. Thank you really you. do. Thanks, man. You have a lot of rusted on followers mm. and audience and supporters and fans. The way you've picked footy as your go-to, and the way you run your show, like the casualness of it, mm. which is not casual. Actually, it's very purposeful. Mm. I know you know what you're doing. You're both well credentialed. Um, I think. There is very few shows I listen to. I mean, I, I have to say, I'm going to give him a shout out, but I listen to Dan and too. Absolutely. Of course. No, no. He's a gun. But there's very sh few shows I listen to or watch or even follow. But you guys are in the category. Oh, mate. That's very cool. Very yeah, kind words. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, mate. So I, I, and I don't go on many podcasts. Yes, we uh, Only when they're time. important. Mm. So important to me. So, and I come on this because I actually wanted to share the room with you guys. So it's cool. Awesome. Thank you, mate. mate we've had a great it. time. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks, Go mate. Manly Seagulls. Go Manly. <laughs> Could you two just not talk anymore? <laughs> <laughs>